Is it visible to you now? Yes, it's it's fine. It's visible. Thank you. Good. Sorry, somehow uh, Teams reject to uh, to find this file on my desktop, so I have to upload it online. Uh, yeah. Um, so sorry again for all these uh, technical uh, things. It's usually annoying, and uh, we will try to move uh, faster. Uh, just one clarification: you see only PowerPoint, nothing else, right? Yes, on the PowerPoint. Okay, good, because I also open my notes to make sure it's not distracting you. So, yeah, thanks to um, Sasha's invitation, I have an opportunity to present to you uh, a, uh, a talk which is uh, which has titled uh, Topography of Pogroms, and uh, we will be speaking about special and social history of anti-Jewish violence in the... Uh, imperial peripheries and here of course we are meaning uh, the russian empire uh, at the late 19th and its beginning of uh, 20th century uh, my uh, research interests are um, going a um, bit beyond uh, russian empire in this period so i'm a scholar of uh, jewish migration of um, uh, borderlands between uh, two empires in Eastern Europe and then Soviet Union and Poland uh, and some other things. So my main interest to uh, the uh, pogrom history uh, is actually coming from migration history because um, back when I was writing my uh, PhD thesis, I was interested on the influence of the anti-Jewish violence on the uh, migration flows from the Russian Empire and uh, that's something uh, that um, drew me to uh, bring me to the uh, history of the pogroms and uh, make me investigating some particular cases which I'll be showing to you today. Actually this talk is um, a bit experimental because uh, two cases uh, that I'm going to focus on are not strictly connected and uh, they are rather two examples of um, violence that are coming from actually different uh, uh, time periods and from different parts of empires and uh, we'll see how it goes but uh, in the end uh, First in my conclusion and then in the discussion with you, we will try to talk uh, on what we can see in common or what is the difference uh, between these cases and uh, try to think about some um, patterns that uh, are relevant to both of them. Uh, but I have to start with a um, little disclaimer. I'm not going to talk about any uh, Lithuanian cases. Uh, first of all, I'm far from the specialist uh, on Lithuanian history, know it basically uh, only from the books. And uh, uh, second important thing is that uh, uh, there in Vilnius you have uh, uh, several great experts on Jewish history, on anti-Jewish uh, violence, and uh, here you see book of uh, Darius Talunas, uh, Enemies for a Day, which I would say um, one uh, of the best uh, books on uh, pogroms history, if we are speaking about few last decades uh, of this historiography, and uh, Darius uh, is, uh, Stalunas is investigating their uh, exactly Lithuanian uh, cases uh, and uh, explaining some local uh, sp specific features of anti-Jewish violence. I'm not uh, going to bring any Lithuanian cases, sorry for that, and probably uh, most likely won't be uh, able to answer your question if you have one about uh, pogrom events in some particular cities or towns uh, that you might be interested in in, uh, in your country. 
Uh, we will be speaking uh, about uh, two cases today. One is uh, border town uh, between uh, Russian uh, and Austro-Hungarian Empire, Volochiska, you can see it right here. Uh, and another is uh, a bit bigger uh, uh, town in the southern uh, provinces of the Russian Empire, it's Melitopol. Uh, so uh, I just bring here map of uh, contemporary Ukraine just to show you where the cities are. Maybe some of you have been to these uh, parts of Ukraine and uh, you know to just fam familiarize you. But honestly, uh, today's talk has nothing to do with this particular map, and we will be uh, rather speaking about this one. So we have uh, two. Um, quite uh, um, interesting cases. Uh, first, so uh, Western uh, mark is Volochiska, border town, uh, and we will be speaking about 1880s and uh, some features of anti-Jewish violence there in this uh, small uh, uh, destination. And, in, uh, and about Melitopol, we will be speaking about uh, a bit later events. Uh, anti-Jewish violence in uh, uh, dur uh, during the Russian Revolution at the beginning of 20th century, 1905-1907. Uh, and uh, what unites our focus on both of these talks is that uh, in both cases we uh, have chance to investigate not only Mm, violence itself, which is of course very important, but uh, also social and spatial structure of the violence to see how violence uh, were uh, was coming to the city, what was the mechanism of its spreading, how it uh, mm, how it uh, wo worked actually at the urban spaces and what actually happened with social structure, with urban space itself uh, during this violence, after this violence, and in regard to this violence. Um, without uh, further longer introductions, we could uh, go to the um, first uh, case. Uh, now we will be speaking for some 10-15 minutes about uh, the pogroms that happened in the Russian Empire in 1881-1883. Uh, so even um, some events happened even in 1884, but usually we are saying 81-82 because most of the pogroms were happening uh, exactly uh, in this uh, first uh, um, year and half of um, uh, these, of, of these events, and uh, there are many cases, and there are many uh, of of the pogroms. Many of them actually, uh, th there are much more cases of prevented pogroms and uh, pogroms that uh, did not happen or of, or almost happened due to different obstacles. We could discuss it further later. Um, but we have uh, a bit more than 250 uh, pogroms recorded, uh, recorded by authorities, recorded by uh, different sources. And um, probably some of you might know that first uh, pogrom happened in uh, Yelisavet Krat. Um, uh, which uh, which is Kropovnitsky nowadays uh, in the in mid April 1881, uh, and uh, as you see from this map, uh, violence very quickly uh, spread it uh, uh, into whole uh, south uh, western part of empire, mostly in uh, Yekaterinoslav, uh, Tavrida, Kherson, Poltava, uh, Kiev, Chernihiv, and other governorates. Uh, it was um, basically, um, so provinces I, I mentioned, it was basically uh, regions with higher spread of anti-Semitic rights. Um, however, uh, only few pogroms recorded in Volinia and uh, Podolsk uh, governorship 
uh, which bordered Habsburg uh, Galicia. So here on the map, uh, you could see them uh, with a bit lighter, much lighter uh, color in terms of spread of the pogroms. Um, and um, uh, th there, was, there were um, no much episodes, only few. Uh, so, and uh, this uh, wave ended only in 8084, but we will be speaking today uh, in regard to Volochesk um, uh, about 8081. Uh, like two bigger pogroms in this area that I'm speaking about uh, happened in Volochesk and in Zmerenka. You probably, some of you might know Zmerenka, it's a quite big uh, train station one of the most known and prominent shtetls, um, and very important place for uh, Ukrainian Jewish history. And uh, from um, mid-spring uh, uh, and uh, through uh, most of the summer, uh, we see um, uh, this first way, quite huge way of the pogroms that is spreading in this uh, region, uh, regions that you see on the map. Another way of the pogroms um, already happened uh, in the winter of 1881, 1882, and uh, uh, it's actually uh, took place a bit to the north in uh, uh, the, um, uh, as well in, in the kingdom of Poland and uh, uh, which was also part of the uh, Russian Empire. And uh, of course, the most prominent uh, pogrom of this way was a Warsaw pogrom, very much connected to uh, celebrations of Catholic Christmas. Um, uh, uh, we, um, so many scholars try to find explanation for um, how these rites moved and uh, how, uh, what was the pattern, why some regions are, were affected by the pogroms and some weren't. And there are actually uh, quite a lot of theories. Uh, almost none of them can explain all of the cases that we have uh, on the, um, on the, uh, on this map. But still, um, why I'm mentioning Catholic Christmas is spiritual, religious part of uh, um, of the violence is very important and we will, we will see it a bit uh, later. Uh, and uh, if we are speaking about waves, uh, of course, uh, the next and last big wave was in 8082, uh, which was connected this time to uh, Eastern Orthodox and uh, the largest pogrom, and not only largest in terms of casualties, but also largest in terms of uh, different narratives, literature produced on these pogroms was pogrom in Balta. Um, but today we are speaking about Volochysk. Um, nowadays it's a really small town in between Ternopil and uh, Khmelnytsky Oblast in Ukraine, and uh, um, it's hard to um, think of it uh, if you don't know history of this place. It's it's hard to think of it as very important destination in Ukraine from many points of view. Um, so a uh, pogrom here in Volochiska uh, uh, happened uh, at the beginning of May, uh, 1881, uh, and uh, uh, it's very interesting that we have uh, court materials uh, from the, the same year, from November 1881. And uh, thanks to these uh, court materials, we uh, could um, very much uh, reconstruct what was happening in the city and what was, um, uh, how pogrom actually looked. So uh, here, uh, you see the quote, which is uh, actually the um, uh, beginning paragraph of these uh, court materials. And um, 
if not all of you can uh, see it clearly, I will read it uh, loudly. Uh, the program began on May 4th uh, at uh, 9 o'clock in the evening. A crowd led by Austrian subject Pet Levani, carrying pets, crow beds, and horse attacked the tavern of Jewish man Simcha Reusen. According to his information, the damage around 3,000 rubles. Uh, the peasant, peasants beat his wife and stole a string of uh, pearls, rings, and uh, 435 rubles, which she had uh, hidden in her uh, stocking. They are best clothes uh, to samovars and uh, copper pots were stolen. Then the crowd moved to house of Mortko Petlevane, uh, oh sorry, Mortko Porcelan, uh, whose uh, property was uh, partly destroyed and uh, partly looted. According uh, to him, the damage was uh, 10,000 rubles. The crowd beats his wife and children and stole 225 rubles from the, uh, from the wife and uh, 412 uh, and 575 rubles from the sons. Uh, why I'm reading this, uh, such details, uh, just to give you a feeling how this uh, kind of uh, report uh, report uh, court report looks it's actually not not much different from any uh, police or court investigation we could see uh, we could see today so they are in details describing as uh, portraying this uh, victims portraying uh, uh, participants of the pogroms in very small details they are describing uh, uh, properties that was damaged uh, and um, uh, I believe it's very uh, valuable source, um, but not only in terms of knowing how uh, many rubles were stolen from some household, uh, but also it's very important to um, think about what we know about the pogroms, because uh, uh, First thing that very often we could uh, learn from uh, different diasporic literature that Russian state was uh, kind of um, one of organizers of the pogrom and Russian imperial state did not punish the pogromist and uh, of course involvement of uh, officials especially local one it's still quite a big issue for the historiography and we have many cases where official played uh, uh, very different roles, so they could be a part of pogrom movement, they could be kind of passive observers, they could prevent the pogrom, as in some cases it happened. Uh, but generally, uh, court materials and then uh, court decision about sending uh, part of pogromists to prison proves that uh, uh, pass general passivity and uh, lack of justice, uh, it's rather miss than a uh, historical fact uh, in many cases, of course, not in all of them. And uh, another uh, important um, uh, thing that we have to keep in mind, very often when we are speaking about uh, pogroms, um, from nowadays perspective, we are uh, thinking rather about pogroms from the time of civil war uh, and revolutionary Russia, or we could think about Kishinev pogrom it's from the beginning of 20th century. But actually, uh, of course, there was a physical violence, but pogroms of 8081, 8082 were uh, much less um, had much less bloody nature. So, of course, many Jews were beaten, some even were killed, but we cannot speak about a uh, large number of uh, people uh, who uh, were victims, who were murdered in the pogroms. Let's look now at uh, the uh, closer map, which will uh, let you a bit better understanding why this very small uh, town uh, is uh, worth to considering and worth to uh, talking about because right next to it you could see 
uh, the uh, river's brooch, which is at the same time the border between two empires. And this proximity to the border basically um, very much affected uh, the processes in the uh, town and uh, basically uh, it um, um, allow us to also investigate the pogrom from differently new and uh, uh, interesting angle. Uh, you will see what I'm talking about in a few minutes. So, um, uh, in the same day, uh, as uh, court just describes uh, May 4th, uh, in Vienna, uh, very important liberal newspaper, Neue Freie Press, wrote about uh, 200 uh, children and their mothers in the uh, trading facilities at uh, Udvolochiska. Uh, I'm quoting, while the most of the Jews, uh, ha uh, meaning from Volochiska, had to spend the night outside. Uh, so, uh, it's end of the quote. Uh, so the press uh, publication uh, uh, claimed that uh, uh, not a single uh, Jew stayed in Volochysk, uh, considering the Jewish community was about uh, uh, 1,600 people. Uh, we could really escape, uh, imagine some mass escape from the uh, town through the border. Uh, and uh, but uh, it's really difficult for historians to calculate how many people cross the border uh, eventually, and um, we cannot really trust uh, newspaper publications so much uh, in this regard because uh, they were based on very short telegrams that uh, were sent from Podwolochyska, Podwolochyska, as on this map in Polish, um, to Vienna. Uh, and um, next day, uh, the same newspaper published, uh, uh, sorry, two days later, uh, published um, new material, uh, again, coming with information coming from other side, Austrian side of the border, from Pivolochiska. Uh, and um, this time they are already speaking about peak of 400 people from Volochysk, so uh, it's already uh, totally different numbers uh, than we could imagine knowing general population of uh, Jewish, uh, general size of Jewish community in Volochysk. Um, so basically after violence occurred, uh, this few hundred people, we don't know exact number, they uh, tried to cross the bridge, across Rivers Bridge, to hide on the Austrian side of the border. And um, what is interesting is that Austrian uh, border uh, authorities did not place any uh, uh, obstacles, did not prevent this uh, entering, uh, this crossing of the border, which from the point of view of both empire was illegal because only person from uh, passport could travel through the, so only Russian citizen uh, with uh, issue, a passport issued by governor could travel through the border. And uh, for sure we could say that uh, absolute majority of these people didn't have these passports. Um, and uh, so, but still, um, we uh, have this episode, they are crossing the border and again, uh, coming back to newspapers, we uh, have uh, this uh, description. Uh, uh, don't be uh, confused with different dates. We are speaking about uh, Georgian and Julian calendar, but I try to uh, make notes uh, for you to, to not overcomplicate it. And, uh, in uh, here we uh, see already uh, more details, the scene of escaping the city. And um, we see um, that Russian authorities at first prevent Jews from crossing the border. 
that uh, when situation became kind of uh, critical and uh, uh, this uh, house and this crowd became quite dangerous even to uh, people each to each other in this crowd um, Russian authorities border guards uh, broke the law and finally uh, let uh, these people to cross the border and um, of course in, uh, in Pidvolochiska, also quite a small town on the other side of the border, there was no infrastructure to accommodate these uh, people. So they were, at least for if, uh, at the first night, they were uh, spending it on the streets, basically. Probably some of them um, were accommodated at houses or maybe with some um friends or relatives because uh, we know that social economic and economic life of these two towns were very close um but so here here actually you could see the uh, bridge uh, i'm mentioning so it's view from austrian uh, side and uh, you could see uh, that maybe i'll make it like that it will be better so and you could see um the exactly bridge where this scene was happening this bridge of course in another form still exists nowadays and is one of important infrastructure uh, between two oblasts um so after this uh, chaotic exodus uh, dramatically described by austrian press and uh, uh, we even we see um very uh, so we see uh, physical violence, plundering from press report. We see elements of sexual violence against Jewish women because they are mentioning that some of them are beaten, coming without clothes or their clothes is damaged. So we definitely can assume um, all these things, all these horrible things that happen to these people. Um, but what is interesting is that, uh, first of all, Russian court do not mention uh, this exodus at all. So they are not interested or have interest to not mention it. And another surprise that we could find in the uh, sources, uh, it's next morning. So if we are still on uh, Russian calendar, it's uh, May 5th uh next morning uh these jews who were escaping dramatically overnight through the border this uh, scene of mass violence they are returning back they are returning back uh, with aim to uh, grab some of their belongings uh, and uh, this time a few hours later closer to uh, uh so in the middle of the day they are coming back already to the border, but already with wagons uh, packed with children, different property, older people. Um, and uh, so they are basically bringing something that could be valuable on another side. They are bringing some food and uh, uh, um, and uh, it's uh, happening at the same time with pogroms in the city itself. So it's really amazing how uh, in such proximity could be quite, at least from the sources, could be quite organized escape, carrying different, uh, um, different items, and in the same pogrom happening in Volocheska. Um, and uh, from press, we know that uh, a lot of property damage uh, took place, particularly at, at this day. Uh, why is Wolochiska case and this border proximity, as I already stressed, is so important? Because border actually allow us, it's quite unique case for uh, this uh, general history of the pogroms, border allow us to see uh, this escape. Because if we are speaking about many other cities, or very often scholars are assuming that um, Jews were kind of hiding beyond the city, trying to move to places with less uh, intensive uh, 
violence or where violence, violence were prevented by authorities, for example, but still we don't really have a lot of documents on that in most of cases. And here, due to the border proximity, we could really trace uh, almost each time when bigger group of Jews uh, are escaping city and crossing the border, uh, which uh, is really a fascinating case in terms of uh, border history, in terms of history of uh, refugees uh, for uh, in between two empire. Uh, so, as you already understood from these short cases, I mentioned most of people basically escaped the violence as reaction to pogroms that is happening on their streets, in their houses, or they are grabbing their, um, their valuable uh, um, property and coming to another side of the river, to another side of the border. But uh, some interesting cases also happened a few days before the pogrom uh, on May 1st, for example, and this case is uh, described in detail also in the court materials. Uh, there are several of them. I will mention only one in order to save uh, the time. So Mortko uh, Freeman, merchant uh, from uh, Volochiska, who um, uh, he received warning about the pogroms a few days before May 1st. And um, it's very interesting episode described as that he as a witness and uh, as a victim, uh, both actually at the court materials, he described it. So he has um, controversy about the money with one of uh, um, his customers, Adam Belinsky, uh, and um, uh, Adam Belinsky, who, uh, as we may assume, own money to Friedman, uh, promised him that, uh, um, so due to this conflict, uh, um, his property will be attacked. Uh, his business, uh, business of Friedman, will be attacked. Uh, and um, uh, next day, uh, Vasily Krylov, uh, who uh, in a few days uh, already plays role of one of Pogrom's leader, came to Mortko and suggest uh, and suggest to to um, sell his store for some not very big price because, and here I'm quoting otherwise, he will be robbed. However, the witness did not agree and uh, took most of his valuable belongings. He does not know uh, who took part in the robbery because he was in, Austri uh, in Austria uh, on the night of uh, May 6. So uh, we see that um, Pogrom was already there, at least in rumors, at least in talks between people. And uh, as in case of this Mark, uh, Mortko, many people actually uh, try to uh, escape before. Uh, but still, uh, Mortko um, uh, knew uh, um, names of the uh, criminals who, who were threatening him. Uh, and um, uh, actually, uh, it's interesting that he uh, is uh, pointing to these people because many people uh, don't. Uh, it's very interesting um, in this court material that even Jews who are uh, counted as the victims uh, at the court, who pre presented as the victims, they are not uh, mentioning or trying to avoid mentioning names of their neighbors who took part in the robberies, in, in this plunder. Um, and we could explain it due to um, social proximity between Jewish, Christians, and other um, uh, people in uh, such small towns. And uh, actually, uh, rather, uh, there, there might be different explanations, but the most logic one that they were really afraid that this pointing 
to particular people uh, could uh, uh, be dangerous for their further co-living in the town. And um, uh, what actually uh, happened next, uh, it's quite interesting and we are not going to go this sto the story deeply, but part of the Jews who escape Wolochiska to Austrian side became refugees in Austro-Hungarian Empire and uh, they were staying on the border uh, waiting for some uh, help uh, or at least for something to happen with them and due to the involvement of international uh, aid organizations, uh, Jewish organizations from the West, part of them moved to the West, but uh, to uh, kind of um, stre uh, to kind of not fully agree with the stereotypes that pogroms are causing migration directly at least uh, we could say that um, most of these people escaping uh, who were escaping to Austrian side they returned to Wolochiska and if we look at the Mm, demographical situation in Wolochiska in 10 or 15 years at the end of 19th century, we clearly see the Jewish community is not becoming smaller, it's actually growing. And from uh, other sources, we see that um, even between people who were pogromists and victims of the pogroms, we still can see economical, social and other cooperation, co-living and other uh, things uh, that neighbors do in such small towns. So it's um, very important for our understanding that pogroms in 1880s in many cases did not change this social structure and social relations on the city. And we could only uh, come back here to the title of a book by Dario Strunasev that I mentioned that in this case, pogromists and Jews were uh, victims for a, for a day. Now we are going uh, briefly uh, to look briefly at another case. Oh, I'm saying briefly because I still would love to uh, hear your question and have some discussion. So I'll try to not uh, speak very long. Uh, we are coming now to Melitopol, city uh, in uh, Ta uh, Tavria Gubernia uh, on uh, nowadays southern Ukraine, city that you might know from the uh, news because uh, since late November, it um, of the uh, late February of this year, it is occupied by Russian troops. So. Um, uh, become quite known uh, for um, audience, uh, audience also abroad. Um, so I don't think I need to uh, go in details of Russian revolution for, uh, that is happening in 1905-1907, uh, but uh, Russian revolution create some um, um, uh, context um, for the uh, pogroms uh, to happen in, in it, because uh, Russian um, re revolu revolution of 1905-1907 uh, actually kind of um, undermined the imperial monopoly um, on uh, on the use of force and. Uh, this allows massive use of violence, especially in urban areas. And uh, we can see from the literature that we are talking here not only about Jews or ethnic motivated violence, it's different kind of violence, but empire for these uh, few years is um, really weak in terms of uh, um, preventing any kind of uh, violent um, episodes in the in the cities and towns uh, and if we are comparing to uh, early 1880s uh, there are um, so the situation for empire and for use of uh, let's say armed forces against pogromists it's uh, much more uh, harder to organize for imperial uh, for imperial um, 
uh, imperial institutions. Um, and uh, so Melitopol um, at the beginning of 20th century uh, is quite big uh, town for this region. It, it was uh, about, uh, with population about 16,000 of people uh, and uh, more than 40% of them were Jewish. Um, the second largest group were Russians uh, and uh, um, Quite typically for Tavria, city and its surroundings has a really large number of small ethnic groups uh, who live there. Uh, actually, even uh, nowadays, uh, despite um, Soviet uh, uh, politics, cosmopolitan politics, and uh, Russification of different minorities, uh, ta uh, Ukrainian uh, Tavria is still one of the most uh, multi ethnic regions in terms of uh, Eastern Europe, in terms of number of minorities, even not all of them are uh, considering themsem themselves as minority, but still, um, uh, this tradition is kind of ongoing, um, uh, of course, with a lot of challenges in the last nine uh, months. Um, due to uh, the weak uh, telegraph connection and uh, frequent strikes of railway workers, uh, information about revolutionary events of Melitopol uh, were coming to Imperial Center or to any authorities beyond the city quite slowly. So at least a few days uh, it took for uh, authorities in, uh, to learn what is happening there. Uh, again, here on the slide, you see a uh, court in Odessa that happened uh, uh, in a uh, year, uh, so, so that happened uh, 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 about, uh, also that happened in, in Odessa about Melitopol pogroms and again we see a quite detailed investigation of the events. Uh, this time um, actually uh, more, much more pogromists are receiving uh, uh, punishment and much more of them are identified but it's not only connected to the what victims are providing uh, as information to the court, but also connected to very active involvement of uh, police investigation, which is uh, who are investigating not only uh, anti-Jewish violence, but also investigating the uh, revolutionary events, political disorder in the empire, which probably is much more uh, crucial for imperial police than pogrom itself. So um, uh, pogrom in Melitopol also happening uh, in spring, April, uh, in the mid-April, so actually second half of April, April 18, uh, 19, uh, uh, 1905. Um, and if you look at the historiography, it's usually considered as one of the first or even the first pogrom uh, in uh, empire during the revolution. And um, uh, because, because actually um, most of the episodes of anti-Jewish violence occurred in the empire a bit uh, later uh, in uh, uh, 1906, uh, most of them. So due to the court, uh, we know that uh, in the evening about seven o'clock on April 18th, uh, more than 150 uh, men most whom uh, were in uh, a state of uh, intoxication or uh, or at least uh, after using some alcohol began to smash uh, smash Jewish uh, shops and uh, um, uh, Jewish um, businesses uh, on the Yarmarkova uh, Ploshcha so uh, uh, Yarmarka Square and uh, let me see if it's visible here. Yes, yeah, so it's basically uh, in uh, this part of the city. So they are smashing Jewish um, uh, 
or actually, yeah, it would be here. Uh, starting here, um, they are smashing Jewish uh, businesses. And um, uh, so uh, we see how the pogroms uh, moves and uh, it start. So many of these men are coming from uh, rural area here from the suburbans and they are entering city uh, here on the main uh, uh, avenue, Nevsky Avenue. They are starting smashing Jewish businesses in this area. Uh, then they are uh, trying to uh, move um, to uh, a bit to the north of the city, to this part and um, few days later, uh, Crimean uh, press uh, describe also uh, these um, events in very details and uh, um, very, imp very important was uh, uh, events on uh, ne next to a uh, pharmacy shop, uh, approximately, uh, here, so it was here, uh, because uh, the owner of the pharm pharmacy, Reich, um, he um, is not um, just witnessing attack uh, of on his uh, pharmacy. He is trying to use two guns, actually two revolvers, attack uh, uh, against this uh, uh, crowd. And uh, even he is not very uh, trained shooter, so we don't have casualties there, but still it's scary for uh, this uh, crowd of pogromists and uh, of course for the um, press it's, you know, this mm, tasty detail that they are um, making into a big story, but it's very interesting episode which learn us, uh, we, from which we could learn that uh, Jews in this case are using uh, uh, firearms, which of course almost never happened in 1880s. Uh, and again, bring us to, uh, brings us to revolutionary context and general uh, instability of the empire, in the empire. So um, <clears throat> also in this case, very interesting is uh, that due to politicization of society in the uh, context of revolution, and due to existence of many national and social uh, organizations in the city, we already see um, uh, uh, units of self-defense, Atriade uh, Samabarone. So they are uh, were organized, uh, but not only uh, by Jews themselves. Uh, so police reports 50 Russians, five Karaids, five uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, few Turks, few Armenians, and a lot of Jewish uh, young men uh, uniting into these um, territorial defense units. And basically, um, let me make this map a bit bigger. So basically here, uh, Targovaya Street became kind of uh, barricade uh, and uh, 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 young uh, uh, women and children were moved to houses as it are beyond this central area somewhere here uh, and part of them were moved to synagogue here and um, Jewish self-defense basically creating on Baranzovskaya and on Torgova streets kind of barricade and they are trying to actually not trying but stopping the crowd uh, so basically street fights are happening and um, um, it's um, very in detail described in the court. Press is trying to avoid uh, these kind of episodes. Bec uh, my explanation is this because it's not uh, very much in favor of uh, authorities to show that in the city, in quite a big city with a big number of police officers, it's, it's possible for street fights to have uh, place. Uh, so, and basically a uh, crowd is trying to get to the synagogue, which uh, they cannot, uh, could not succeed. Uh, so basically somewhere here on um, 
April 18th, programs uh, is uh, ending. Um, but still, um, mm, on uh, September of, or on April 19th, it's continuing in the morning, uh, but uh, again in the same area, again effect attacking Jewish businesses. But in this case, we also see involvement of police, and um, basically pogromists are. Um, facing police at first, and then uh, uh, on April 19th, army uh, to, uh, military troop are entering the city and basically securing the city from uh, to preventing uh, preventing any further episode of uh, anti-Jewish violence. Uh, as a result, we have uh, uh, no murdered people. 35 people uh, with different casualties. And interesting thing is that uh, mm, bigger part of these uh, people who had uh, who, who were wounded, uh, they are pogromists. And um, that's mostly due to army and police kind of using all the forces they have against them. Uh, so among pogromists, we have much more wounded, wounded people than among Jewish, Jews themselves. Um, so very important is social and economical, economic part of this uh, uh, episode, uh, because uh, if we are uh, speaking about, uh, um, and I think here I can go to next slide, because now we are kind of trying to see some common sense, because uh, in case of Volocheska, uh, most of pogromists are uh, tr workers of railways and peasants from surroundings. In case of Melitopol, it's also um, proletarians and peasants. And uh, it's very important that um, not in many cases, we don't have for sure this ethnic or even some might say rush, racial element, we don't have it. We have social mechanism, social tensions uh, between uh, groups in the city and uh, actually um, beyond Jewish history, we have such cases, for example, in Odessa, there are many famous cases when we have pogroms but not in between ethnic groups, but in between social groups that are affecting uh, different uh, ethnic and religious groups of the cities. But uh, in this case, this social division is very um, visible, actually in both uh, of cases. Why um, uh, beginning of the 20th century is very much different uh, it's, of course, because of uh, political uh, engagement of uh, pogromists. So some of them are connected to union of uh, Russian nations, Soyuz, Ruskova, Naroda, or um, some of them uh, coming to the pogroms after Mayovka, after this uh, sp um, spring gathering of uh, leftist revolutionaries, but also in um, Jewish case, uh, among organizers of self-defense self unit, we see members of uh, Social Democratic Party who are kind of using their revolutionary experience in this case to protect their uh, religious and ethnic group. So this context is completely different from 1880s, when we where we don't see any kind of political engagement on both sides. Uh, coming back to symbolic and ritual uh, explanation of explanation of the violence, we of course could uh, follow here classical Pierre Bourdieu theory about uh, uh, violence being a ritual uh, and. Um, Bourdieu is bringing a variety of historical cases to support this argument that violence is a ritual built on particular symbols. But um, what is uh, important uh, here 
it's a religion because uh, definitely most of the pogromists, even we cannot in most cases identify their ethnicity or uh, their ethnical roots, but in most cases they are uh, Eastern Orthodox. And of course, uh, most of uh, victims are Jewish and uh, Eastern celebration, as I mentioned, uh, in 1880s, but also in uh, at the beginning of 20th century is uh, like peak of the um, unrest and anti-Jewish rights. Uh, it's connected to um, uh, something that uh, my, uh, might be connected to something that people heard at the mass at church about, uh, um, you know, he, uh, Jews who uh, are uh, killing Jesus, at least what, what peasants could hear at the mass. And uh, then we have, um, after the uh, uh, Orthodox, we have all these celebrations and as in case of uh, beginning of 20th century, it's very often that after this celebration, drunk crowd of men starts the pogrom. So it's really connected to, um, <clears throat> to uh, religious celebration. But of course, we cannot build a strict parallel in this case and say that church is clearly provoking it. It's uh, documented in some cases, but in really rare cases. Um, of course, uh, we have uh, um, anti-Semitic and uh, uh, anti-Jewish element because uh, uh, in both 1880s and even stronger in its beginning of 20th century, we have agita agitation, we have propaganda, anti-Semitic propaganda spread around the city right before the pogrom. And uh, in case of 1880s, we don't know much about uh, how this was spread and many of this propaganda was rather rumors. Uh, but in case of uh, early 20th century, it's clearly, um, Anti uh, it's clearly anti-Semitic uh, propaganda, printed one, uh, and spread it with, uh, for political reasons, also as uh, kind of pr propaganda ag against social democrats, because among them we have many Jewish members. Um, and uh, in both cases, we have very mm, uh, complicated uh, reaction of authority. So in case of Volochiska, sources provide us with uh, um, director of train station, director of train station, who is uh, not allowing Jews to hide at the train station, but kind of supporting uh, drunk railway workers in uh, uh, plundering Jewish businesses. Uh, in Melitopol, we have quite similar case with uh, um, uh, director of ch chief of the prison, who is um, reacting in very similar uh, way. Um, so uh, in both cases, we have uh, gendarmes, police, who are not really reacting to uh, the events. And honestly, in both cases, so in case of Volochis, uh, Volochiska, it's only few police officers for whole town and I don't think that it was possible for them to stop uh, the violence but at the same time uh, we don't know their motivations uh, and um, in case of Melitopol we have much more police, we have uh, firefighters units who are patrolling uh, Mayovka, so this revolutionary spring gathering, but when Mayovka ended with the pogroms, they are also kind of disappearing and uh, uh, and uh, only entering uh, uh, troops entering uh, city uh, stop pogrom uh, completely and of course uh, uh, the uh, efforts of um, uh, self-defense units were mm, quite important there in Melitopol and Volochiska. We don't have such episodes at all. Um, 
Of course, in both uh, towns and in both ways of the pogroms, we cannot limit anti-Jewish violence to these few days of the spring when it's really reported because um, you may, we may we see in many sources that it's repeating uh, in, at the same places with the same businesses with the participation of the same people but of course in smaller uh, scale and it's not already noticed as a pogrom and um, mm, we can explain it that uh, pogrom uh, uh, itself creates some space for the violence and uh, uh, it's um, creating uh, or at least somehow specifying the group uh, who could be uh, robbed, who could be raped, who could be killed. So basically, um, we see very in, very interesting and very dangerous uh, tendency in the cities that some group uh, by this few days episode is experimenting. Are they entitled? Are they able to dominate uh, physically, violently uh, on other group? And uh, uh, so pogroms are uh, very important in this uh, case. And... Uh, um, also, even with courts following uh, both pogroms some months later, uh, pogroms also creates some kind of feeling that uh, uh, violence could end without punishment of uh, um, people who are performing it, because most of the pogromists are not arrested, most of the pogromists are not uh, no, beaten or something like that. They are just leaving the uh, places of the um, where violence occurred and uh, basically continuing their regular li uh, life. And um, mm, I'm far from the part of historiography that explain uh, these rights as uh, race one, even in some cases we could see uh, anti-Semitic agitations that use uh, uh, terms close to our understanding of race, um, but um, rather uh, it, it uh, I'm, I'm rather um, mm, use idea of collective or communal violence when uh, this violence, even being spread among empire, is still a local phenomenon and has a lot of local context inside. Um, pogroms, um, generally in the empire, they function as kind of system or network. They are connected, but uh, still, <clears throat> for scholars, it's very hard to explain how they connected for a very long time. Um, the uh, so there was very popular explanations that pogroms are were traveling with railroads so basically the idea was that railroads infrastructure was one that facilitate or make possible spreading of the pogroms and of course in some cities we could see um, such cases but generally scholars even try to follow the first months of uh, pogroms in 8081 uh, and try, uh, trying to connect it to railroad connection and um, it's, it, it didn't work. This experiment is uh, by, um, run by historians so uh, with this network and information spreading it's very interesting question which is not uh, fully answered in the uh, historiography um, and of course um, anti-Jewish violence as any anti as any violence it is appearing in urban, in urban context it's kind of uh, um, a mirror of social um, social uh, situation uh, social situations there and relations between different parts of society and I already bring some cases about uh, uh, class um differences between pogromists and uh, victims of the uh, pogroms and um, 
um, actually uh, coming to um, the uh, con uh, conclusion, I would like just to stress two more um, two more uh, points. One is uh, kind of self-explanatory, but still very often um, it's important to mention it. Uh, when we are speaking about pogroms, as you know, um, nowadays, um, not only scholars, but many other people using the term pogrom to describe basically everything uh, happening in any context, even some events nowadays. And um, mm, for Jewish history, it's very important to uh, see limitation of this uh, term. So uh, I'm really uh, believe I really believe that we shouldn't use uh, without explanation of the context. Uh, we shouldn't use term of term pogrom beyond events of 1880s and uh, events of uh, uh, anti-Jewish riots during the Russian Revolution uh, in 1905-1907, because beyond these events, uh, anti-Jewish riots receiving new and new meaning, and uh, later in the 20th century, we see racial logic for this anti-Jewish violence, and uh, um, I don't think that word pogrom uh, is really uh, useful there. But even in this case, you could see that it's already very two very different stories in terms of politicization, in terms of reaction of Jewish community, but still I believe that it's uh, possible and uh, uh, to use uh, this um, uh, term here. Uh, and to conclude, uh, I would like to say that uh, anti-Jewish uh, pogroms, even having uh, huge historiography already. So it's like uh, more than, we have more than century of historiogra uh, of historians who are writing very serious researchers, researches on the pogroms. Um, somehow most of works are trying to generalize, most of authors who are trying to generalize this story are um, not doing it completely because when we are going to particular cases when we are going to urban spaces we see this dependence of the pogroms on spatial component on social structure on particular geography around and uh, for example in Volocheska the case of border is crucial so um, i'm saying that to stress out that it's extremely important to look at micro cases and not only to be able you know to investigate some events into detail but also to be able to uh, challenge general understanding of anti-jewish violence and generally violence in urban spaces i'll stop here sorry for talking quite long uh, yeah I, really, I hope there are still some people in there and we'll be happy to hear your questions and comments yes we are still here uh, and more people here are in uh, our team's room so uh, any questions while they are thinking uh, I wanted to uh, ask you about the Mayovkas uh, I didn't understand what, what is this. Could you please explain what is so, this? Yeah, it's uh, Mayovka, uh, which we um, know from uh, Soviet time as gathering uh, to celebrate uh, some Soviet holidays. Mayovka was the uh, social democratic uh, um, revolutionary practice, so basically uh, Activist, uh, le leftist activist, uh, were gathering for this uh, Mayovka, uh, and uh, it's um, very much was patrolled by uh, police, and uh, uh, because um, so they they use it kind of as um, gathering uh, of uh, not party but of. Uh, 
uh, people uh, of the same political ideology, and it very often was used by different uh, for different propaganda, for example, for declamation, uh, anti-Tsarist declamations, or so. Yeah, and in case of um, many uh, pogroms uh, during uh, first revolution, uh, uh, it uh, Mayovka actually was kind of pretext for the pogrom movement. Thank you. Uh, I see that there is a, a person who would like to ask something. Uh, please un unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would like to uh, thank you very much for the for the lecture, for the information, and um, I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, the migration from Lithuania to Scandinavia, um, 1860 till uh, in the First World War, and um, uh, the Litvak immigration, and um, so it's much more than Lithuania, but Lithuania. Uh, Poland and uh, and uh, Latvia is is the major area. We have also some from the eastern part of the Litvak area and from Kiev surroundings. And um, I wonder um, how uh, do you see the um, migration from the areas mentioned? Uh, um, were they uh, did the programs? Um, in these areas result in migration uh, towards the, the West or uh, or in internal in, inside the Russian uh, Empire? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I actually uh, tried to only briefly mention migration in uh, this particular talk because, you know, uh, migration for a while was uh, Jewish migration was my ma main topic of my research and uh, I, I was afraid that I will go to to deep into the details. Um, so um, we uh, should really be careful with connecting pogroms to migration, you know, as a lineal process, because uh, as we see evidentially that um, first of all, economic difficulties and uh, general situation in the empire uh, for uh, is forcing were forcing uh, Jews to leave in the same way as uh, many others groups uh, in the empire were leaving and uh, it's important also that Jewish and non-Jewish migrants in most of cases used uh, uh, the same uh, patterns the same uh, ways to uh, escape the empire but still, of course, pogroms is uh, it's a huge event. It, uh, they are they provoked uh, people uh, people to escape their uh, places of residence, and uh, we have case of uh, Volochiska where it's quite logic to cross the border, right? But um, generally, Galicia, as you may know, in in the uh, 1880s, becoming kind of uh, Ref, uh, quite big refugee spot, more than 20,000 people from Russian Empire from very different uh, locations are uh, staying there. And uh, we can see very interesting uh, tendency that uh, it's when pogroms started, um, so we see mostly refugees from the regions that are close to the uh, to the border, so the same actually happening in the uh, Baltic part of uh, Russian Empire. Uh, people, if they are escaping uh, violence uh, by uh, migration or at least uh, mobility, um, they are trying to find easiest way. Uh, but what is um, uh, important uh, and uh, I believe uh, might be useful for you is that when we have established already uh, infrastructure and some mechanisms for uh, the migration, it's this, uh, this proximity of the border doesn't matter anymore. And for example, in 1882, when in Galicia, in Brode particularly, we have already representatives of Paris and Venice Alliance Israelite, uh, people who are representing Baron Girsch and other and many other 
Jewish organizations and philanthropists trying to solve this refugee crisis, trying to help these people to move to the West or at least to um, somehow change their situation while they are staying on the border. Uh, as soon as this information spread through the Russian Empire, we have uh, quite a lot uh, of uh, people coming from different areas, including uh, people uh, from uh, Latvian part of uh, the empire. Probably uh, you might know uh, uh, Ego, uh, so, so the, the memoirs of Abraham uh, uh, Kahan. Uh, he is actually from Vilnius, but um, it's quite an interesting uh, book uh, published in Yiddish already when he was uh, uh, in uh, much older and uh, when he was living in, in the US, uh, but he was traveling and he describes this episode, he was traveling from Vilnius to Galicia and then from Galicia to the United States and it wasn't because even today, you know, uh, imagine traveling from Vilnius to Galicia, it's like really a uh, long way. It would be much easier for him for, uh, to cross uh, a border to Prussia, right? And to go directly to one of the port cities. Uh, but he, as many uh, other Jews, uh, basically um, using existing infrastructure and aid that exists there. So, and, um, mm, of also knowledge about possibility to receive this so-called so ticket to America uh, somewhere in Brody or in Galicia. It's spreading around the empire. It's very hard to trace because it's usually, you know, sources that are not, uh, can be, uh, could be, as it could be not found in the archive, but there are at least few sources like small propaganda, printed propaganda among the Jews that you should go there to Galicia because there you could receive this ticket to America. Uh, and uh, in this case, we could see any kinds of people uh, like Litvaks at, um, and many others. Uh, Scandinavia uh, in this part of the story is not very active. so. Uh, some of the some of uh, Jews, uh, because I mentioned this twenty something thousand crowd who is waiting on the border, so about six thousand of them went to the U.S. and there was uh, uh, about two thousand people who were uh, settled uh, around Western and Northern Europe. Some of them came to Scandinavia, but it was really small number of people and. Uh, I don't think that, you know, looking if we can find Litvaks among them will tell you uh, more about the patterns. Uh, but uh, I believe uh, in uh, your case, uh, we should speak more about uh, Prussian border and uh, look at um, checkpoints and border situations there, because uh, probably they were also going to Scandinavia by uh, not very logical from nowadays point of view, but existed way through uh, German port cities. So that would be my idea. But as, as I said at the beginning of my lecture, I don't know much about uh, Lithuanian case. Sorry for that. No, I was mostly interested. In, uh, thank you for for the answer. I was uh, mostly interested in in, um, in the migra migration from the uh, south uh, southern part, uh, present uh, uh, especially um, uh, metropolis area and uh, towards the west. Uh, uh, when it's concerning Scandinavia, of course, um, the, the uh, Jews who came to, to Sweden uh, first, um, they didn't need any passports and uh, they came uh, mostly uh, from um, uh, Riga and, uh, and the uh, uh, Liepaja. And uh, the economic situation in Scandinavia was uh, equal with the situation in the US. So um, it was uh, even a re emigration from the US to Scandinavia in many cases. But um, um, I got the point, so thank you very much. It was interesting. Thank you, Alexei, so much uh, for your lecture. 
Uh, you are very welcome to our library and in Vilnius. When you have a chance, please uh, come for a coffee or for a lecture. Uh, it, it will Thank you. Fun. Yeah, it would be very nice to, because I honestly haven't been to Vilnius. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, it, um, hopefully my next event there will be offline one. And yeah, it's usually we hope so too. Thank you one more time. Uh, have a nice and safe evening. And uh, thank you too for inviting and for uh, to our audience to stay with us until so late. Okay, thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye bye.